Hi, I'm Margaret Brinig, known as Peg. I'm newly retired as the Fritz Duda Professor of Law at Notre Dame Law School. And I'm Nell Newton, most recently the Dean of Notre Dame Law School and now a Professor of Law at the Law School. We um, realized in preparing for this that while our paths have converged at several points, we're two really quite different people with different stories and we are also very good friends so the, if this is a little informal that's why um, we, we do know each other's stories pretty well. Excellent. Um, I came from a family since we're supposed to talk about families that was very wealthy and very dysfunctional. <laughs> I uh, grew up in Milwaukee. Um, I have two younger brothers um, and school for me was always an escape from whatever else was going on in my life and it was certainly true when I was a kid, when I was um, shy and um, a nerdy and uh, unathletic and found that I c could keep from getting in trouble but if I just did well in school. <laughs> um, my family expected me to go to college. All four of my grandparents uh, went to college and um, my grandmother after whom I was named was a very successful novelist. Um, it was less certain exactly what I was going to do in college. My parents both um, were physics majors and my mom had a PhD in physics and so I think they thought I was going to be in science but it was fairly obvious early in high school that that science and math were not my forte so I uh, originally wanted to be um, a novelist like my grandmother. Um, however, English in college is not the same as just writing creatively so I migrated into history fairly early on. I went to Duke um, and the reason that I, that I ended up there was partly to, just to escape my family, um, move as far away from Milwaukee as, as I could without being in California where I had two first cousins also from Milwaukee who were um, students at Stanford and I really didn't want to compete with them anymore so um, I branched off on my own and, and uh, went to Duke. So Peg, given your family background, um, you didn't have any trouble financing college, I, I take it? No, um, my parents were prepared to pay for the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, but I um, got, I was in the first group of people who were named A.B. Duke Scholars, and um, as part of that experience, you get, uh, currently get a full ride plus a, a semester at Cambridge. When I was there, it was two thousand dollars, and I don't know what honestly what percentage. It could have been a full the, ride. I don't know. <laughs> could have been. I have no idea what percentage of the uh -huh. um, tuition was paid for. Well, we're similar in that we both grew up in the Midwest, and that our families were dysfunctional. Uh, we're different in that um, I grew up uh, in um, what I think would be best described as uh, extreme poverty. There were times when we had uh, no food or very little food. Uh, there was a time when we lived in Michigan where we ate oatmeal every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which is why to this day I do not particularly like oatmeal. We um, had, um, our grandparents were wealthy. It was my mother who um, had married wrong, been abandoned by her husband, which in those days was regarded as her fault, and um, you know, was left with, with us kids. At times, we then, we then did live with our grandparents. You had academics in the family. Did you have any lawyers in the family? Yes, both my uh, maternal great-grandfather and my wow. maternal grandfather were lawyers. So you come from a family with a rich history of educational attainment. Yes. My grandparents did not go to college. Uh, some of my uncles uh, went to college. My aunts were not to, go, they went to finishing school, not to college. Um, and so there was no expectation of me going to college. In fact, there was outright hostility by my grandfather to my going to college because he felt that I would, um, you know, end up with the wrong people 
and I think he also hoped that I would end up staying in St. Louis and taking care of him. So I was on my own and had to finance college on my own. I think unlike you, well, you had an expectation that you'd be interested in science, but pretty early on you knew that that was not the case. I had no idea. Like you, I was, a, uh, I was very shy. I would say I was painfully shy, still am to a certain extent. Very nerdy, bookish, intellectually curious about anything. I spent one summer reading everything I could about World War II. I can't tell you why today. I was particularly interested in World War II at the time, um, but I, w I read kind of voraciously, as I'm sure you did too. But once I got to college, I had to focus so much on supporting myself, and I dropped out quite frequently and really had no idea what I might do. There was one lawyer in the family, an uncle, but I didn't really have anything to do with him. And in my family, the notion that a woman could be a lawyer was just unthinkable. Uh, so I started at George Washington U because I could live with an aunt and uncle in Arlington, Virginia. And then uh, when I really couldn't afford that anymore, I literally got on a Greyhound bus and went to California by myself because somebody told me the schools were free there. And I ended up graduating from Berkeley, and Berkeley did not charge me. The little tuition that they charged, they did not uh, charge me any tuition and also gave me some a living stipend that enabled me to finish college. But even at that point, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up other than not be poor. The thought of being an academic was appealing, but there weren't any women academics that I knew. And so again, I didn't really think that was a possibility for me. I did have one really strong um, woman academic figure in college. Nice. Um, her name was Juanita Kreps, and when I first got to know her, she was an economics professor. Interesting, because I ended yeah. up in that area. Um, so I took a couple of courses from her, and she later became dean of women, and I was um, elected to be head of the woman student government at Duke, so I had quite a few uh, dealings with her uh, over That's the great. years. At the time that, that I graduated from Duke in three years, and at the time when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do next, there were sort of two paths, and um, the most likely path was to pursue a graduate degree in history, which was my major. Um, but um, I took the LSAT after playing bridge until like 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> the night before on sort of a, could I do this or, or, or not, and did well on it. And so I ended up deciding to go to, to law school. And um, Duke had, it was very easy to just move from, from uh, the undergrad to the law school at Duke. So, uh, did they have a three three program at Duke? Was they it did, a but I didn't program? do that. I okay. had a, I um, worked. Uh, I came in with a lot of advanced placement credits, mm -hmm. and then I did some coursework over the summer mm -hmm. uh, in the heat, and mm -hmm. and uh, so I could could uh, start law school early. So I was mm -hmm. always kind of young mm -hmm. um, in my class. And why was law school appealing to you at at that point? I don't know. I think at, at that point, um, I'd started a romantic misadventure that would end up with my transferring to uh, Seton Hall in uh -huh. um, uh, lovely Newark, New Jersey. And um, he was a law, a law student. He was uh -huh. two years ahead of me. So um, I think that probably was the, I mean, it was dumb, but it was a, the, probably the precipitating factor. And I always, um, one of the dysfunctions in my family were that my parents were very politically dissimilar, and so there was a lot of discussion of the issues of the day, which uh, being the 50s and the 60s, there were a lot of issues, as there still are, um, so that, that we argued a lot at the dinner table, and kids were invited to say whatever they thought, even though we knew nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, there was a part of me that thought, well, maybe law would be okay. It would be useful. I wanted to save the world, and it seemed okay. like that might okay. be more practical than having a PhD in history. Well, another yeah. similarity with us is that we often describe our careers or things we did as almost accidental. I used to describe it as the serendipity path. Uh, well, this is available. Maybe I'll try this and see if it works. 
And uh, I think that happens less often with young people today that they feel they have to have everything planned out. I had a great deal of anxiety. It's not like I was happy all the time of trying to figure out who I was and what I would do. But looking back, it does seem that uh, you know, somehow I stumbled into this, that, and the other, and, and things uh, worked out. Uh, I did graduate from Berkeley, but I forgot to mention that I had dropped out and was working as a, a, a legal service, in legal services in San Francisco as a secretary and then a paralegal. And it was that experience, that, that moment I met, the first woman I ever met in my life who was a lawyer. I had never met a woman lawyer uh, before. And I began to think, well, maybe women can be lawyers um, because I just was not raised with any expectations. And at that point, even help wanted ads were still help wanted men, help wanted women. Mm -hmm. And then there she was, Susie Tangway, and she seemed very competent. And the next thing you know, I was thinking maybe I'll go back to school, finish up my degree at Berkeley, and uh, and become a lawyer. And I guess I had dual dual goals. One was you know feed myself, support myself, um, and save the world. So I think today many law many uh, youngsters go to law school because they want to save the world, though we also know that many go just because they're not sure what they want to do when they grow up. Yeah. I thought about the Peace Corps, too. Uh -huh. um, but I, I read some magazine um, article on the Peace Corps, and apparently you had to kill a chicken by strangling it. And <laughs> I, I didn't think I was, I, I couldn't even do um, dissections. I didn't take biology, because I, I thought I'd get sick if I had to do dissections. So, uh, it, that's why I didn't do the Peace Corps, yeah. and this seemed to be another, you know, kind of another way to do There's that. There's some good in the world. Yeah. I didn't know any women lawyers either. Um, I knew one woman who may or may not have been a lawyer came and talked to the girls' school that I attended, um, and she um, was unmarried and was sort of talking about, you know, you need a career at the beginning before you get married, uh -huh. and then yeah. after your yeah. kids grow up. Yeah. You, you want to have something that you can go back on, or if your husband dies early, you know, and you need to support yourself, this, will, this is a backstop. I remember for those you. stories. Uh, yes, yeah. and with a clothesline and, and clothespins at various points in your life. Uh -huh. It's really, Dear to, today seems a little bizarre. But mm -hmm. anyway, they, um, that was the only, she may have been a lawyer, she was on a lot of corporate boards, I know. Uh -huh. um, but uh, she was, the picture we got of somebody who wanted to be professional was that you couldn't be married and have a family and do it no, too. No, no, that's exact. That's exactly right. Um, it just you just wouldn't be thinking that way. Um, and the first time I met a woman who was married and had a family and was a lawyer, I was really impressed. And now, of course, there are many, many more. So that's sort of what got us to law school. Let's talk about the experiences in law school. I know for me, there was one female faculty member. Well, two things. First, we were the first class that was more than 10%. There was a quota, as you know, on women. It usually was 10% um, as, as uh, the most women that a school would admit. And I'm sure at some elite institutions, it was less than 10%. Uh, our class was 15%. I went to uh, UC Hastings uh, for law school just because I was in California. I had gone to school at Berkeley. Um, I applied only to Berkeley. Never occurred to me I wouldn't get in. Like you, I took the LSAT on a dare. I didn't really study for it. I got in there and it was like, oh my God, there's math on this LSAT. <laughs> Nobody told me that. I still got a pretty good score and um, I certainly a good score to get into Berkeley. But it, it hadn't occurred to me to think that my application might look odd to the committee given that I dropped out so many times. And a, the, a rational person could think, this person is never going to finish law school if it took them this time to finish undergraduate. So fortunately, a friend of mine from Legal Services said, you know, Hastings is a pretty good school, and it's right across the bay. Uh, why don't you apply there? I did. They accepted me the next day. They waived tuition, and so there I started at Hastings. So there was, I think, at Berkeley already at least one, I think, Herma, uh, Kay was at Berkeley at that point. At Hastings, there was one woman who had just been hired. We were 15% of the class. 
people did openly make remarks and comments about us being there and taking seats for men and we'll just stop when we get married and all of that kind of stuff. And some of the professors did call on us, you know, in a very um, unprofessional way. We had one professor who had just started that year and at the end of the year said, I don't need this anymore and quit because the guys in the class didn't respect her. They wouldn't stop talking when class started. And she just didn't know how to control the class. I mean, it sounds like I'm blaming her and that's not fair. She really just couldn't get the class to, to you know, just sit down and pay attention. And um, so after she left, another woman came my second year in law school and she was, I think, still there. My third year of law school, I think they hired the second woman. So there weren't, you know, it was a very male dominated um, uh, uh, experience for me. What about for you? Were there any women professors at the law there school? There were none, either at Duke where I started or at Seton Hall where I ended up. They hired a woman at Seton Hall when I was a third year student, I think. Uh -huh. um, but she was teaching first year courses, so I never encountered her and it was very paper chasey um, uh -huh, yes, when I, especially at, at Duke uh -huh. and um, there were nine women out of 180 so we were oh my God, five yeah. percent yeah exactly. um, and um, some of the women were known to be hunting for husbands um, and some of us were serious although you know we didn't really know what we were doing and I remember my torts professor called on us every other person just to be gender equal. Um, <laughs> was that the real motivation, do you think? Oh, no, he called on us yeah. because he yeah. didn't think we belonged there exactly. um, yeah. and thought he'd intimidate us. Um, and I um, wasn't very discreet in my answers, so I, I kind of wised off it in addition to... Um, saying whatever it was I was supposed to be saying and so I got picked on probably even more than the other people <laughs> did. Yeah. So although I too am really shy particularly with walking into groups that I don't know, um, I, as far as speaking to large groups of people I got over it really fast. I think there's a difference between sort of having an agenda, having a role to play, especially being the teacher or the lecturer uh, if you're giving a speech that somehow for people like us then we're, we're great we can kind of light up and and be seem like we're the most outgoing people in the world but walking into a room where I don't have a role it's just an event it's some big event I'm not running the event then I still to this day will have a, a shy attack could, could you picture yourself in the courtroom I remember in law school I thought well whatever I do I don't really think I want to go into being a you know trial lawyer um, no, I think um, I, I had a problem doing that. What I really wanted to do was teach law school. Uh -huh. um, so you knew that early I on. knew that early on. I think I knew my first year. I certainly knew my second year. Wow. And, but I figured I couldn't do that right off. So I tried to figure out what the best path was. Um, and so then what was that path for um, you? So I clerked. I, because I came from Seton Hall rather than a fancier school, um, I ended up clerking for a state court judge mm -hmm. who started out on the trial level and moved to the appellate level during the year I was clerking for him. Who was the judge? His, his name was Theodore Botter, uh -huh. um, and he had written the New Jersey School Financing Decision, which was a big deal, a big deal and was why I was interested in him. Um, it was in Jersey City, which is not a place I'd recommend for the faint of heart. Um, they actually did gambling in the courthouse where we, where we worked <laughs> down in the... the Not house. going to the court is a gamble, but they no, actually no, you did buy gambling. buy a lot of your from... lottery tickets and <laughs> you had to make political contributions to the oh, Democratic yeah, Party. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just a zoo. But anyway, um, he, I was the first woman that he ever hired. I may have been the last because <laughs> he asked me to do things like pour coffee for the judges' meetings and I just said no, that wasn't something that was in my job description and it's I didn't think it was appropriate. Coffee can be that moment for so many women that you just say no, not, yeah. I won't go there. Yeah. And I, um, I also found it really hard if I'd been, re if he'd asked me to research something and I'd do it, I found it really hard to write opinions coming down on the side that I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I could do it because mm -hmm. um, I was forced to do it and I could see what the other arguments were. But I found that that was really difficult and I think that also motivated me toward teaching because mm -hmm. you can present law in a um, kind of a straight way and allow students to kind of figure out whether they think it's good or bad uh, on any given thing. Could you talk to your judge and say, I disagree with you or have you thought about looking at it this way? Was he open to that? Um, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tried and failed and mm -hmm. he just told me to do it his mm -hmm. way and yeah. that was what he was going to do and, um, and sent me out to, I remember, <laughs> you remember strange things from early on, but I remember he had a, a Porsche and this was the year of the gasoline shortage and he used to oh, make yeah. me go sit in the gas lines oh in my his God, really? Porsche, which is the only time I ever drove one, but <laughs> um, instead of doing legal work and that was also inappropriate, but at least it wasn't gendered inappropriate the way <laughs> pouring the coffee was. Um, right, you'd think that maybe he'd up insist on finding a guy to go sit in a Porsche since it's a sports car, but yeah. no, he let you he, sit in the yes, Porsche. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and then from your clerking, you went into... I um, had a couple of options. One of them was to go back to Milwaukee and work in some big firm, but mm -hmm. it became really clear that they did not want me and I did not want them. Um, for example, one of the firms took me out to lunch at a really stuffy club to which only guys could belong and proceeded to talk about the law firm football team. Yeah. And um, yeah. it is obvious looking at me now and then uh, that football was not my sport uh, to the extent I had a sport. You love football though. I do love watching <laughs> it, but I did, did not love playing it. Um, and um, so I decided that wasn't really good. Um, there was a new office called the Office of the Public Advocate in New Jersey, mm -hmm. which appealed to all my liberal instincts of wanting to save the world. Um, and I applied and got a job with them. It turned out that what I was doing was defending um, prisoners accused of violating their probation <laughs> um, and or parole. And um, so it was administrative hearings rather than uh, trials and mm -hmm. I did it for a year but then they uh, decided not to refund that mm -hmm. position. So there you were. Uh, what happened? Uh, it turned out that my brother had a friend who was associated with a new law school that was just starting in Washington DC, mm -hmm. an attractive place, and that they were um, hiring people who sort of um, matched char my, some of my characteristics. And I figured this couldn't really hurt because I wanted to go into law teaching anyway. And I thought I would have to practice for much longer and develop a reputation. But the opportunity just sort of yeah. came out of the blue. And so I was the first woman that the then International School of Law hired. Um, they were... Um, mostly Christian evangelicals and I was um, fit that description although I quickly became a Catholic after I started there so I didn't fit the mold anymore um, in addition to not doing it for gender reasons mm -hmm. but it was all guys and me. I love it. <laughs> well the um, again the, this is the serendipity point right? Right. Um, when I was in law school I think I was very definitely like you, focused on public service, public interest. In fact, I was going to be a VISTA volunteer back at my old legal services office. And I realized we should put in some dates here. So I graduated from law school in 73, in 76. You graduated in 75, right? Uh, no, I graduated in 73. You graduated in 73. Mm -hmm. I started law school in 73. Um, and uh, I knew that I wanted to do that, that kind of work. I had actually worked for the Peace Corps as an administrative assistant at some point, and I knew about the chickens, so that wasn't going to be happening. But having worked with the poorest of the poor in San Francisco, uh, I felt a, a real calling uh, mm -hmm. to, to do that kind of work. They had no money, so a VISTA volunteer was paid I think $10,000 a year or something at that time. That's what I need. And that is what I was going to um, be doing. My third year in law school, 
Um, and by the way, I didn't do a clerkship because I didn't know that I wanted to be an academic. And you had to apply your second year. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what I was going to, you know, at that point, I said, well, why, did, why not just go be a VISTA volunteer at my old legal services office? So I never even thought about doing a clerkship. I got on the law review, but only because my best friend said, "Well, you ought to. You're a good writer. You ought to go. You ought to go to go onto the law review." I think I thought it was like the magazine or something for the law school at first, and then quickly learned that there was more to it. Um, my third year, one of my um, one of the few professors that I felt close to, John Van Dyke, who unfortunately died a few years ago, was a constitutional law professor, and I saw him in the elevator, and he said you need to go into teaching. And I honestly just kind of looked behind me like, who, who are you talking to? Why do, you think I, why do you think I would be a good teacher? And he told me why he thought I would be a good teacher. And I thought, hmm, you know, there's something to that. I said, well, how would I even do that? He said that he had started, he went to Harvard, and then he taught for a year legal writing at Catholic University, where they had recent grads teach legal writing. And it was in Washington, D.C., an appealing place for me, even though I lived in San Francisco then. But San Francisco can wear on you because it can be very crazy at various times in its history. And he said, well, why don't you apply for my old job? They, I just got a notice from them that they're looking for someone. I'd be happy to put in a good word for you. And then if you like it, then you know that you like to do teaching. Then, of course, you would go work in a firm for four years, and you would do this and that, and then you would sign up with the AALS, the Association of American Law Schools, and go through all these processes. And I thought, well, at least I'll, I'll try it. So again, it was just one conversation in an elevator. What's really funny about it, too, is he said, well, give me your resume. I didn't actually have a resume. You know, Vista Volunteer didn't ask for a resume. You just filled out a form. So he helped me put together my resume, and I got the job. So again, sort of almost accidentally, mm -hmm. we ended up in the same city right around the same time. I guess it was, I started in 76 uh, in teaching, and you started in teaching in 75. 75. That's where I got that, that's where I got that date. Do you remember when we met? I, I'm not sure, it was 70s, 80s? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It was either the late 70s or early 80s. Yeah, that's what I would think. And there were very few women there were Law very professors. few women, and we banded together. We did indeed. And someone started, it was not me, uh -huh. you might know who it was. I think it was Karen Sapansky. Okay. At, at University of Maryland Law School. Yeah, she's lovely and has remained a good friend of Wonderful both of ours. Um, yeah. uh, started a, a group that uh, fortunately included me because I was in the area, uh -huh. even though I was in uh, Virginia, right. and eventually branched out and we had some people from Maryland and some people from West Virginia by, right. the, DC. by the end. At the end it was the DC, D Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Western Pennsylvania. Women's uh, Law Forum. Yeah, exactly. Um, Do you remember how many people were at the very, maybe the first time we had any kind of informal meeting? I, the, the informal groups I think were usually less than 10 and they yeah. were usually at somebody's house. Yeah, exactly. Um, sort of potlucky. Uh -huh. style. Um, the f more formal meetings, and I remember one on teaching and one on scholarship mm -hmm. from the early years, and that's probably where we met, um, were more like 20 yeah. people. Yeah, 20 and some would of be them, a really pretty good s size group. Yeah, and some of them were just, just were legal writing people, yes. um, and some of them were tenure track. Yes. Folks. Yeah, we, we consciously wanted to spread our arms wide. We even began inviting women who were interested in teaching. We definitely had women who were legal writing instructors. or Clinical on, people, too. We had, of course, we, had, we were wide open for our clinical people. Jane Aiken, who's now right. the dean at Wake Forest, right. was somebody who was, when she came to Georgetown, was a member of our group. So some of them were in clinical fellowships, uh, and now there are more, many more sort of teaching fellowships. But we were very eager to mentor each other, because mm -hmm. did you have a mentor at uh, at George Mason? No, I never. No, uh, <laughs> I, since there were no other women, the, almost the entire time I was there, there were sometimes there would be one, and in one case I think there were three of us, um, out of I don't know, 35 or 40 uh -huh. uh, people, 
and I was usually senior because I'd started, you know, early on. Um, there was never anybody like that. Yeah. So you sort of had to make it up on your own. Yeah, very definitely. I think to be fair, a couple of the guys were, were good mentors on teaching techniques or ideas for teaching or the people who taught contracts. I remember one guy in particular, Lou Barricato. You know, he'd come down, we used the same book. And he'd come down and say, well, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? And, and he treated me like an equal. And I always appreciated that. Um, there was an associate dean, Bill Fox, who was, I guess, the closest I came to a mentor. He was a running buddy, so we ran together and would talk about legal education. I learned a lot from him. But not really that kind of, you know, sh help shaping your career uh, type mentor did I have until I, we put that group together. And I really don't, I think Karen really was the, the, the force that, that started it. Um, but we were such a small group to begin with, there were so few of us. And if you just did look at regular faculty, not not um, you know contingent one year contract faculty members, they were they were fewer still. I think Georgetown maybe had three or three or four women, mm -hmm. and I remember being very impressed with 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 that with that fact. Um, so I think that group was very formative and instructive for me. I felt more comfortable talking about teaching challenges and scholarship issues. Um, and kind of going and, and promotion and tenure issues uh, with fellow with fellow women uh, who are going through uh, similar situations. When when you were at George Mason, okay, you didn't really have a mentor. Were there other ways in which, or were there ways in which you felt, I don't know, there were obstacles to your advancement or that yeah. things were gendered? Uh, things were were very gendered. I, uh, there was one. Um, guy who was on the original faculty who always called me little girl uh -huh. and he'd say how are you doing today little girl and I mean I'm short but uh, <laughs> being being called yeah. a girl even though I was much younger than he was really insulting and inappropriate yeah. and yeah. Um, there the one thing that happened and I think this happens to um, underrepresented groups in general is that I got put on every committee mm -hmm. Um, as a sort of a token, and I, I think um, the whole the whole idea of sort of um, us against the world uh -huh. became very obvious yeah. Yeah. in yeah. things like that, yeah. uh, where you you really couldn't say no. You really wanted to to get more women or minorities of various kinds, and the only way they were, that was going to happen is if you were there and actively rooting yeah. for somebody. But it took, it was a time suck. Yeah. And, and you had children at this point, um, right? I didn't have, I started, I had my first child in 1978. So okay. it was a couple before of years. Before tenure. Before tenure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it got increasingly crazier trying to, to do that. But I always felt, um, and I think women still, uh, feel like their examples and they've got something to prove their examples yeah. they're not just themselves but they're representative of of another group mm -hmm. and that's a it's a hard road and mm -hmm. it, I think again I think it's true of every underrepresented group you feel you tend to feel that way but certainly for yeah. women early on uh, we did yeah we felt we couldn't be just average we had to be better well we also and couldn't be the typical independent contractor who just um, did his teaching and uh, then devoted his time to scholarship, not being worried about taking care of the kids if there were kids at home, having a lot of uh, you know time to do that, and not being too involved in uh, faculty committee work because really it was a little bit beneath him. And that's uh, many uh, faculty colleagues were like that when when we were still are coming up, and there are maybe too many of them. Men, I, I do have to say, getting out of time here. One reflection, especially as a dean, is who are the best institutional citizens at every law school? And I've been associated with four as a dean. Um, they are, they tend to be women. There are some men too, but there are many, many more women who are the ones that if you've got to get something done, you, you know, they say give it to a busy woman. Will you uh, give it to a busy person? In this case, it's often give it to a, a busy woman. I had not quite the same experience, I think because 
I tended to speak up. I can be a little mouthy. Um, I was not put on any committees except uh, admissions. Maybe I was on the library committee once. At Catholic U, which is very old-fashioned, only full professors could serve on the committees that mattered, appointments and promotions, which were two separate committees there. And uh, that's why I wanted to become a full professor as soon as I could. Uh, full professors also got double votes on everything really important. And uh, so the, they just weighed more. And therefore, they were asked to chair the committee. So I didn't have any experiences of leadership while I was at Catholic U. Whereas I, I suspect you were not only serving on committees, but also chairing some committees at George Mason. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, not, I don't think I was chairing them until I was tenured. Uh -huh. But but I certainly was. Yeah, you don't want anybody was, chairing committees before their right. tenure. That that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Right, and yeah. tenure for me was a close call. Uh -huh. And I think the uh, the four guys who were making the decision felt that I wasn't likely to write. Um, that I had done as much as they had actually before tenure, but that uh -huh. that it was likely to stop then, and I'd. Um, kind of fade away, and uh, therefore, it it just wasn't. Uh, That's so interesting. Worth making the gamble. Did they have any? Were there any facts that would lead them to conclude that, or is it just women? Probably once they get the security of tenure, will that's all they want, and so they'll stop. Or? Well, yeah, and I guess I think they felt that maybe I'd get so sucked into doing administrative things that I wouldn't oh. be interested. Oh. Also, because uh -huh. I'd already been drafted. Uh, for so much stuff. Fascinating. And so yeah. what year did you get tenure? Do you remember? I think it was 1981. Uh -huh. I think um, for me it was 1983. And then it was a long, long time before I got a promotion. Right. And part of that is because the law school, um, because I was doing administrative stuff, but also because the law school changed mm -hmm. really significantly. and. Law and economics became a really big deal at George Mason. They hired a, a, a dean who was sort of solely focused on it and who hired only um, economists of various uh, stripes. And a lot of my friends left, the other women left. And I was sort of uh, making a choice about um, whether I wanted to become an economist too or whether I, I had to look for another job. And at that point, I was, um, I was still married, and I was sort of stuck in DC, uh, therefore. And um, it, it didn't look like it was going to be easy to, mm -hmm. to get another job. So I decided to go to grad school in economics. I remember those conversations and how impressed I was that you were going to go get a PhD in economics um, at, at that time. Well, it was. Um, it was a really hard time, yeah. um, and I, I think my whole mode of being at that point was sort of day-to-day -day survival. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that childcare was um, a little bit straightened out, and that I had backup plans for days when the um, baby babysitter uh, got sick or something like that, or somebody had a snow day or something. I had to have a, a backup plan. Sometimes they fell through, and kids were at the law school disrupting things. But but um, it was uh, enough so that I think the kids still talk about those. My kids still talk about those days wow. as uh -huh. days when they felt they were on their own and had, even though we always had somebody in the house, that they had more responsibilities than mm -hmm. other kids of their age had wasn't necessarily bad for them. Uh, they're all successful, yeah. and uh, I don't have any axe murderers yeah. uh, among them. Yeah, but, you've got a great family. But um, they, they uh, yeah, they, they just felt a little were bit Were you pushed. in family law? You were, in, you were teaching family law at that point before By you By that point, I was. I started out teaching criminal law and corrections because, really? oh, because that is what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then they hired... Um, somebody from the Judge Advocates Corps mm -hmm. to do criminal law, and so I did constitutional law for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then they hired somebody to do constitutional law. So my dean suggested that family law was 
a place that was sort of a theoretical disaster mm -hmm. and that I could actually make a difference if I could come up with a, a different way of, of looking at it and thinking about it. And that ended up being a so great exactly suggestion. So yeah. I started teaching it in the fall of 1976 uh -huh. and, and it became my main research and writing area for the next, I don't know, 42 years yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and then you combine the tools of uh, economic analysis. I don't think, had anybody done that? You were the first really I to do really that, I was really the first you? family law person. There were a couple of scattered articles. Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy who's now emeritus from the University of New Mexico Business School mm -hmm. who had mm -hmm. a combined JD, PhD, mm -hmm. who did some family stuff. Um, Interesting. But he didn't do any empirical work, and that eventually became what I... Um, did mostly, I mean, I did some theory too, but mostly empirical scholarship. And this was not popular among women colleagues. I went to one of uh, Martha Feynman's oh dear God. difficult conversations, uh, meetings, I think she was at Cornell then, and got lambasted by another woman for um, being using the tools of the devil. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Which she felt economics was because all economic analysis is evil that kind yeah, of thing yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I unlike some of my colleagues at George Mason didn't view it in a political kind of way I, I used, thought of it as a tool and kind of a useful way of looking at problems or actually figuring out whether the solutions that I thought would work would work yeah um, sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. Yeah, and sometimes you wish they did. That you wish that, that uh, the things that we're doing now would work, but then when you find out they don't, that's extremely valuable information. Yeah, and I, and I think if you're um, a good sort of social scientist, yeah. you're willing to change your, yeah. your mind. And one of the ways in which I did is I started out being very opposed to no-fault divorce and thinking that it was going to hurt women's bargaining positions mm -hmm. because so often I thought um, guys had pushed them to the brink and fault divorce would help them because they could get more money. Um, but it turned out the opposite. It turned out that women were more apt to file in a no-fault mm -hmm. kind of a situation. And it, so it changed my mind on what I thought was, was right. right. That's and such an important contribution to be able to point that out. Uh, well, no, yeah, I mean, at the point where I did it, I mean, I, it, was a, it was interesting how many, because I thought that a lot of the cases would be because of um, domestic violence mm -hmm. situations, which is far more often men than women. And it turned out um, it was less than 10%, I think. Interesting, like that. yeah, interesting. I think uh, bringing social science tools into the law has been one of the great innovations of the, I mean, of course it started in the legal realist movement, but then kind of died and then, you know, it really picked up in, in, in uh, the last 20, 30 years. It's been a great um, innovation for law. I think it's helped. I think when they get really theoretical, it's less useful. Yeah, when it's, and I've read papers that were all math. Yes. No, I haven't read them. I've said, all math, I'm not going to read this. I don't know yeah, what it means. Yeah, and I slugged through it, but it's still, um, you know, I, I just say, if somebody's, I do a lot of refereeing for journals, uh -huh. and I always say, you know, make sure that somebody who, who cares about the, yeah. the equations um, is involved in, in refereeing, too, because I'm kind of looking at the ideas, and yeah. I think the ideas are good, or I think yeah. the ideas uh, have some problems, or I think they're completely missing uh -huh. um, the context. I think that I've always been much more of a pragmatic scholar than a theoretical scholar, um, partly because that's all I knew. I mean, just deep analysis of cases and statutes with an eye toward uh, what is the best and just way to configure um, the laws so that they benefit, you know, benefit society more, uh, but not so much uh, starting from the abstract. The abstract for me might come out of um, the, the lines of cases that I studied. And my field was American Indian law, which I also fell into um, because um, always being interested in um, how marginalized groups make it in the world, being kind of a member of a marginalized group, you know, poor white folks myself. Um, in law school, I needed a summer job 
and I got uh, work study money to work and somebody, um, a guy that I met through friends was running California Indian Legal Services and said, why don't you come spend the summer with us? I actually said, are there still Indians in California? I mean, they show the level of my great ignorance at that point. Kind of feeling like, well, didn't we get rid of all of them at some point or another? And that summer was revelatory because I learned about Indian law, but I also met Indian people and saw the effect that some of these amazingly horrible policies had had on their lives. And also learned how complex Indian law was complex to a degree almost as if it was designed to keep people from understanding it or really engaging uh, with it. It was very formalistic uh, in, um, and very convoluted. And uh, so when I went back to law school after that summer, I decided I would write my student comment on Indian law. And uh, then when I went into teaching, I thought, well, I'll teach a seminar in Indian law. At that point, there were under 10 people in the country teaching uh, Indian law. There's one book that had just come out, uh, thank God, um, and you know it, it really um, had an influence on me. And so in our group, I used to give the talk about how to write a really good doctrinal uh, piece because that's what I kind of knew how to write. But I also always wrote for a particular audience, and that was uh, people in the field actually doing Indian law because there was just not any adequate material out there. So whether or not the person was working for a tribe or uh, being sued in a tribal court, there was nothing they could go to to figure out what to do, um, nothing. There was a treatise that was written in 1941 that had never been updated. And so in my work, I tried to sort of point out some of the basic principles of Indian law but also then get into how the doctrine developed uh, over time. And, um, uh, you know, that, that was my, my scholarly work. When, when I went into teaching, the job that I took at Catholic University that I started in 1976 was to teach legal writing for a year. And then you may recall I said that my, my beloved professor had said, then if you want to teach, and I realized right away that I wanted to teach, then I would go work for four years. So I was in the process of doing that, and there was some political upheaval at Catholic University that you know would be too long and boring to go into. But all of a sudden, there, we didn't have a dean, and then we had an acting dean, and um, several of the women left, and they didn't really have any women. And they said, "Well, why don't you stay and be a professor?" And I said, "Hey, you know, bird in the hand, yes, absolutely." But and this happened a lot in those times. I got a visiting professor appointment my first year. And they gave me four courses my first year. Um, typically now, um, uh, anybody starting teaching uh, has a more at least one course release uh, during their first year. They only prepare one class their first semester. And often just one, they add a class the second uh, semester. But I had to teach four my first year. And I thought, well, gee, what could I teach? Well, I, could, I think I could teach Indian law. Uh, what else could I teach? Well, Indian law is a lot about property, so property law, anything but contracts, I think. And my dean said, we need you to teach contracts. So I taught contracts in Indian law. Contracts was a full year, so I got credit for that uh, in the spring as well. And then they added conflict of laws, which I fortunately had had a really great teacher, so I knew a little bit about conflicts of laws. But they used to do that. It would just be, mm -hmm. you were the, um, Somebody called me a utility infielder once. I had no idea what that meant. But um, I later on came to understand it was a baseball reference. Um, and I think possibly more women than men were like, oh, we need somebody to teach this. You're a good person. Why don't you uh, teach this? At the end of my first year, my first set of evaluations and contracts were not good. And um, well, they just, they just weren't good. I really didn't know what I was doing. I think I was trying too hard. Uh, I was going into way too much detail. I think I was trying to show that I really know this stuff because all I did was obsess about contract law since I didn't know anything about it really until I started uh, preparing to teach it. And I uh, had one summer to do that preparation. And I was defensive and um, other things. And then, of course, uh, there were very few women teachers, so that may have had something to do with it. 
So the faculty decided that I would only have a one-year contract again, and that was the make it or lose it year, that if I didn't bring my evaluations up, then that was going to be that, which really put a lot of pressure on me. Fortunately, I kind of figured it out and did very well in my evaluations at a wonderful contracts class. So then they put me on the tenure track. So those two years didn't count. Probably a good thing, so I didn't have a lot of time to write. Then they put me on the tenure track at that point. You had issues getting tenure. I sailed through. I think that my school was very proud of the fact that finally, you were the first woman, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. that finally they were gonna tenure a woman a faculty member. And I'd written a lot. But then, I don't know about Mason, but when I started at Catholic, the culture there was, um, well again, very male. Lunch and conversations were always about sports, never about law, rarely ever about ideas, maybe about teaching. They really did value teaching, but it was very gendered in that way. And the scholarship, there was not much of an expectation of scholarship. And I was publishing and publishing well and really throwing myself into it, discovering, much to my surprise, that I actually loved, loved to write. And so they, they happily gave me uh, tenure. It was a great year, 1983. Um, but then when I went up for full professor, there was a, a lot of opposition to my being a full professor. And that was a very painful year for me. I knew that if I didn't get full professor, I still had a job. Tenure is security. And I think at our, at our meetings of our group, I was the one who would often say, tenure is security, but full professor is power. At least that's the way it was at, at Catholic. And I felt that my colleagues were much more comfortable giving me security, because all women need that, right? But much less comfortable about giving me power. So that one colleague, in fact, said, you have the best file I've ever seen for full professor, based on your scholarship and your teaching. But you're harsh and uncaring, so I don't think I'm going to vote for you. And most people who know me, those are not the adjectives that come to mind. And the reason was I had become a bit of an academic hawk, so I would advocate in favor of hiring people based on their scholarship. I would not support retaining people who hadn't written anything. And um, that hit some people in the nose. I did get it. Uh, and, uh, you know, very glad that I did get it. But it, w it was a difficult year for me, and it's the reason that I left Catholic U, because at the, at, you know, after that experience in the late 80s, I guess, when did I get, uh, when was I promoted? I wrote it down here. Um, full professor in uh, 1988. I felt very devalued. And... Um, I visited for a year at American University. They uh, were very interested. After that year, I went back to Catholic U, but American University was very interested, made me an offer, a higher salary, a much higher salary. I went to see my dean, and I said, here's the deal. And he said, we'll miss you. So there was no attempt to match the salary. I don't really think that would have happened to a guy who got an offer at a higher salary. Uh, so that's when and why um, I left America, uh, Catholic U. But at that point, I felt I'd established myself as a scholar, and I felt like I, I had figured out how to teach well um, for my students. Now, you left George Mason. When did you leave, and how did that um, happen? 1999. Um, I had been, first of all, my family situation had changed, and I ended up being becoming a single parent to uh, four and then five small children um, uh, for a very long time. Um, and so I didn't, I was trying really hard and actually um, Kid's dad was very supportive of um, our keeping, keeping him in, very involved uh, uh, at home and with the kids and um, he used to drop over and have dinner uh, one night during the week, uh, it was always Wednesday, but he'd just come over and, and we'd ask him if he wanted dinner and he'd say, oh, I didn't have that big a lunch, sure, I'll have dinner and he'd eat, you know, like a normal, normal portion, mm -hmm. if not more. Um, 
And we did a lot of all the vacations and holidays and all that kind of thing together. Um, and I think that was uh, really good for the kids. Uh, it was a very um, kind of constructive relationship where being married had not been very constructive, particularly toward the, toward the end. Um, and and, I, and I'm, some of it was my fault too. I'm sure I was putting so much into work that, and mothering that I just couldn't be a good wife, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially not in the way he wanted. Um, so I didn't have the absolute anchor that I had mm -hmm. um, earlier. Um, I was involved with a, a church um, where my kids went to school that uh, was also dysfunctional, moving from one dysfunctional mm -hmm. family to, to a different one. And um, so I didn't really have any ties there either. And um, a, couple of, a couple of schools had shown interest in the past, but I hadn't gotten hired. Um, but this particular year, there were three that were showing an interest, and it was uh, Notre Dame and, and Iowa and Northwestern. Mm -hmm. I and Iowa um, wanted me to visit for a summer, and I figured for a summer I could handle um, moving away from a metropolitan area into to Iowa City. Um, and I liked a lot of the people on the faculty there. And it, they made me an offer. Um, George Mason was willing to match it at this point because I was writing a lot and had been for um, a long time. Um, might have been the most productive person on that faculty yeah, at I that point. Yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't feel comfortable with either Northwestern or um, Notre Dame because Iowa had sort of made that investment in me mm -hmm. by having me visit. So that's where, where I ended up. Um, and I was there for seven, uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about sort of expectations of what you think you want to do and what you end up doing. And at some point, saving the world seemed less of a viable option. And being a dean seemed more mm -hmm. viable. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out at Iowa that I wasn't selected to be a dean. And so when Notre Dame and Northwestern resumed um, pushing mm -hmm. uh, for me to come, I eventually uh, decided to come to Notre Dame. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Where the paths are going to converge again. Uh-huh. I know. It's, it's so interesting how we were together and then we went off. I, um, my experience at American U, uh, which I started probably about 1992, was not as great as I thought it would be. Um, uh, you know, it was a school that really did um, favor the independent contractor and was also at, at that time still very gendered in some deep ways that I hadn't initially understood because there were women on the faculty and it was only after I got there that I began to see, hmm, this wasn't a great fit for me. And um, although um, the associate dean tried to pr promote me to be the associate dean, partly because he wanted to get out of the job, uh, our dean was definitely not interested in putting me in any positions of leadership. So it's beginning to get frustrated. Um, I threw myself into activities with the DC, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, et cetera, a group of women law professors, which is just such a nurturing and great group. And also the women in legal education section of the Association of American Law Schools, we were both involved with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the chair at one point in the 1990s and um, organized a program on poverty, you know, uh, class and uh, gender together, since that was something that came out of my own experience. And so I had these nurturing relationships, primarily with groups of women, the local group and the national group. People began nominating me for deanships. And it was sort of a similar thing to my professor asking, telling me he thought I'd be a great teacher. Somebody called me, I think it was Vermont Law School was the first call I got. Uh, and said, you've been nominated to be the dean, might you be interested? And I said, well, why was I nominated? <laughs> what did they say about me? And he said, well, this is, these are the things they said about you. And I thought, 
oh yeah, you know, maybe that is something. I said no, I, I wasn't at that point ready or, or interested in, um, in you know, becoming a dean. But it did plant a seed mm -hmm. so that um, about a year later, uh, DePaul was looking for a dean and um, they called me and uh, I said, well, you know, maybe I will. First I said no and then I changed my mind later and I called back because I had ties with Chicago through my elder brother who had died in 1995, but I still felt very close to him and, and, uh, and the community in Chicago. And so it was very late in their process and I didn't get the job, but they went for a, a, an experienced dean. They were concerned that I'd never been an associate dean, completely rational uh, you know, concern. But what made me feel really good is the women on the faculty took me out for lunch at the next day ALS and said, you would be a great dean. We want to help you be a dean. We want to help you how you present yourself. We want to give you some advice, you know, how to get around this problem with the associate dean. It was so great. And then the women in DC were also very supportive. So the following year, I actually applied for, you know, uh, you know, a number of deanships. I think that was early on when the Women Deans Data Bank was run out of Georgetown. And once you said that you were interested in being a dean, you would get a lot of brochures um, from schools that were looking for deans. And so I looked through them and I applied, believe it or not, to seven schools. And I was a finalist in six schools. Good for you. Um, I was impressed myself. And I had to go to all of these um, interviews at the AALS. And this is another example of our little, our little DC group. A bunch of us got, I don't think you were in that group, we got a, we got a, a suite together. So Akimer, Christian Dark was there, and Karen Sapiansky, and I'm not sure who else was there. And I was leaving my suite to go downstairs to get some coffee, um, getting ready for all these interviews I was gonna have. And Sapiansky, Karen Sapiansky actually stopped me at the door and said, where are you going dressed like that? And I said, what do you mean, Garrett? You know, she said, you, you, look, you don't look like a dean. Everywhere you go at this conference, you have to you know, look like a dean. And so she made me go back in and put on my proper suit just to go down and get coffee. I was whining like a little kid. But um, it was an important lesson on, on stepping into role and uh, you know, so many things I'm grateful to Karen for. Um, I decided to, wrongly, uh, I chose Denver. Denver uh, made a very strong offer. The president of the university himself kept calling me, he wanted me to come. And so um, I only went to three interviews of my finalist interviews and had three to go, but um, decided that I would, would go to Denver, in part because the president of the university was a very compelling guy. He'd come from business, Dan Ritchie. Um, he really was 100% behind me. He wanted me to clean up the place. The junior faculty were very excited about me. They felt that I could really get people more engaged. And um, when I got there, I sort of realized there were all these different factions. They were always at each other's, you know, um, fighting about things. And, but I, was this, I viewed myself as the person because I had a mandate from the president of the university. I was going to clean things up. And I was going to side with the faculty who wanted to be scholars, who really cared about the place, who were there all the time. They tended to be the more junior faculty. And I made some very hard decisions that had to be made. There are three senior faculty who retired that year, and that was a really great thing that they retired. Um, but what I didn't understand is that turnaround artists um, never stay, because what happened my second year was that the senior faculty and the junior faculty went to war over me. And so the junior, even the junior faculty began to resent me because they were spending all of their time defending me. And I realized that it just, dear me, this wasn't gonna work. So by my third year, I was thinking I was a complete failure and um, began calling some of my mentors to ask, you know, what, mostly women, oh dear, what's gonna happen? You know, uh, this isn't good. When University of Connecticut called and um, asked me to uh, consider um, becoming the dean at UConn, and I went there and had six very, very happy years uh, at UConn. Now I've been the dean of four places, so Denver was 1998 to 2000, no, only two years at Denver to 2000. University of Connecticut was 2000 to 2006. A, a great school, a school 
where women's strengths and opinions were really mattered. A place where I learned that if you really want to understand a place, ask how many women are running things. They've been associate deans, are they running important committees, and how long have they had women on the faculty? And uh, maybe the state of Connecticut is like that as well. That some of you know there had been a governor, Ella Grasso. Women's voices were sort of better attended to. Mm. I never felt gender was an issue at all at Connecticut, whereas at Denver it just seemed to be uh, everywhere. So I was very happy there. Was not ever going to leave, but my alma mater, Hastings, um, asked me to consider uh, to be considered uh, to be the dean there. And I kind of got caught up by, I go back to San Francisco and, um, you know, really add value to my alma mater. And so I did do that and I went in 2006. And I'm sorry to say that Hastings, so it's a wonderful school, was not a good match for my abilities. Partly because the dean doesn't have much power in that system. So I could have a lot of good ideas, but I didn't have a lot of real influence. The associate dean was elected by the faculty. Um, theoretically, he reported to the dean, but the power base was the faculty. The chief financial office officer reported to the board of trustees. The board of trustees was appointed by the governor, and they were micromanagers. And though I think I added some value in my three years there, I was beginning to realize that gee, this was not Connecticut, where I was just really happy. Again, I think at, at, at Hastings, gender wasn't much of an issue. There, there were a lot of strong women on the faculty at, at Hastings, and that was, that was a great thing. But it helped me see that fit just really matters, and I wasn't feeling all that fulfilled. Um, and also, um, I'm more of a middle-of-the-road person than I used to be when I was young. I still call myself a liberal. But I don't believe that law can solve everything and that we need to regulate everybody and everything. And certainly at the California schools and at Hastings, I was regarded as conservative, believe it or not. One of my faculty members called me a tool of the corporate state at one point. Better than the cool so of the actually, devil. Yeah, really. Yeah, the tool <laughs> of the devil. There we go. Just because I was trying to balance the budget, you know, you really ought to try to balance the budget. Um, but I wasn't going to leave, you know, I was going to tough it out because it was my alma mater and I felt that it was important that I, that I try, to, try to work this out when um, the uh, headhunter for Notre Dame called me. Now here's where we come back together again. You know, the, the women's group, uh, the relationships that we had from all those years ago. So what do I discover but Peg Brinig is on the search committee. I was. <laughs> Um, Notre Dame had had uh, a woman before mm -hmm. you um, for 10 years, and so that wasn't as much of a um, sort of sell selling point one way or another, I think, for, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. for the group. Um, it, uh, we were determined at that point to look outside the law school, so we did a, a national search. Um, that was micromanaged by the central administration more than I would have, any of us would have chosen, yeah, yeah. Um, I think. Um, but I, I was delighted to find Nell among the candidates <laughs> and to say, oh yeah, I know her, I've known her forever and she would be terrific. Um, and it turned out that you knew another member of the search mm -hmm. committee also because you'd been trying to woo them to Connecticut. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so um, I'd been at Notre Dame for long enough at that point, um, and I was an associate dean at that point, so I could kind of be comfortable in talking about uh, in selling it mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as a as a, a good place. Well, Notre Dame did a very good job of uh, selling itself to me. And I had an emotional connection in that my beloved older brother had gone to Notre Dame undergraduate. So I had met Father Ted many, many years before. And as a Catholic, the thought of um, a school that took its religious identity uh, seriously. When I was at Catholic U, it, it just was like any other, other school. Um, that was really very appealing to me. And I know that, that mattered to you in your deciding to come here. 
uh, when you're a practicing Catholic at a secular school, and I spent most of my time at secular schools, well, I mean, it's fine, but you don't talk about it, or you don't, you know, well, it's just, it's just different. It's your private life. It's not part of the community. And um, the way that we um, hold on to our Catholic identity has been really important and wonderful for me and in, in my growth in many ways. I also feel that Notre Dame, um, you know, was comfortable with women in positions of leadership because of Patty O'Hara had been uh, a leader at the law school. And um, you were there, so that was really great. And it's been a great 10 years uh, uh, at Notre Dame. I feel that uh, I was able to make some contributions to the school, and it's uh, been a great professional experience for me. At the same time, I'm ready now to turn it over to Marcus Cole, our new, our new dean, and, and let him you know, go whatever way that, that, that he goes. Um, I think we, we might, I don't know, I, of course, not looking at a clock, so I have no idea how much time we've taken with all of this. But I think it'd be good to sort of reflect a little bit on women in legal education, and legal education in general. Maybe we start with the in general. I mean, how do you think legal education has changed since we went to law school and, and since we started teaching? Well, certainly the, I mean, everybody knows that the legal profession has changed. Mm -hmm. And for a school uh, like Notre Dame or like Iowa, um, like Connecticut, that produces a lot of attorneys who used to work in big law firms, um, it's meant that, that either they had to be really focused on doing that, uh, students did, from, from very early on, or independently wealthy, I think, or um, that that was, couldn't really be the focus of mm -hmm. um, what everybody was doing. Um, I think it's also, um, students have changed. I mm -hmm. think they're much more consumers than they were mm. uh, back in the day. Uh, I know for me in family law, it's been interesting that most of my students at the beginning, and especially at Iowa, but at Notre Dame too, were married and had kids um, mm. when, I, when I had them but in their second year. and. Um, now, the last class um, I taught um, in uh, last fall, um, all of them were single. Hmm. None of them, none of them married. Mm -hmm. So it's the demographics have changed yeah, yeah. as well. That's interesting. I think that the um, I recall when I was at Hastings, we had no seminars and no clinics. There was one externship. But it was just, and, it, and I did it because it was at Public Advocates, so it was a public interest, uh, you know, nonprofit public interest law firm. And I got to go there full time, and I got, I don't know, some ridiculous number of credits, like 10 credits. There was no seminar attached to it. It was just go work there, we'll give you a bunch of credits. The ABA would never put up with that anymore. And um, that was it. That was the experiential education. I guess it was moot court. But when I was in law school, if you did law review, you didn't do moot court. That was somehow beneath you. I never figured that out. Um, so uh, now we have, uh, I'm just unthinkable that you wouldn't have seminars. We have a million seminars. But also, Hastings' model really was pretty much everybody took the bar courses. Mm -hmm. There were very few electives. There were some electives, but not that many, and they were more what we would think of as fairly core courses. And um, certainly there was no course in Indian law, for instance. Um, and now we have arguably too many electives. Uh, we have many, many seminars. We've deepened the curriculum. So if you're interested in intellectual property, in my day there would be, I don't even know if there'd be an IP course. It might be a patents course. That might be it. Uh, not a, wouldn't be a trademarks uh, course. Uh, or maybe there'd be a copyright course. Um, and I think at Hastings there was, uh, you know, when I went uh, years later, there was somebody who taught copyright and patents, and that was it. Well, now you'd have to have a basic intellectual property introduction. You'd have to have what we call the regime courses. You've got to have more than one trademark, more than one copyright. You know, so 
law schools began developing almost concentration. Sometimes at many law schools you get, you actually get a certificate showing that you've uh, taken a bunch of courses in an area of the law. And um, that requires a, a lot more uh, investment by the law school in, in the curriculum, in the terms of faculty, whether they be full-time regular faculty, contingent faculty, adjuncts, etc., because you wouldn't be able to attract students. Students are consumers. They kind of already think they know. I want to be, well, I want to be a human rights lawyer, right? That's what a lot of students go to law school, they want to be a human rights lawyer. Uh, well, you can't just have one course. You have to have more than that. If you want to be a school that students interested in international law, you've got to have more than one international law course. And I think in the old days, you'd have, you'd have one. Mm -hmm. You might have a comparative law course. You might have an international law course. That would be it. And I think that's true of all law schools, that we've had to develop a lot of breadth as well as depth in our curriculum, and that's really changed. The other thing is, of course, clinical and experiential learning that there are many clinics and externships. The ABA requires more of us, but also so do our students because they know they need the practical training. They're not going to get the training once they leave and, and go to, to law school. And the other big change I've seen is interdisciplinarity, and I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more about, about that. Yeah, um, law schools have been devalued, I think, by the universities that oh, are yes. associated with them. Yeah. Um, not I Hastings, because it was independent. Yeah. Um, not Brooklyn, where my current co-author teaches for similar reasons, but um, I think main universities don't view a JD as equivalent to a yeah. PhD. Yeah. Um, and it's not, to be fair. To be yeah. fair, it certainly isn't the time commitment that, that right. a six, seven year program is. And it doesn't have as much sort of peer review and writing pressure mm -hmm. and, uh, and things like that, that the, that the other disciplines have. Um, and so I think it's been a, um, the beginning, I think what I saw anyway, was that some other departments would realize that they need, probably needed a lawyer as part of a grant proposal mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So they'd look to see who, who they could find. And I know I got involved, at, especially at Iowa, with a number of yeah. uh, professors at the medical school who were looking for, looking for a, a lawyer who was willing to talk to them. Um, and it's been true here. Uh, so it's sort of, sort of an afterthought that you might do interdisciplinary stuff. But at the same time, I think law school, schools have been hiring more and more PhD in with other fields than um, a JSD. Um, so there was is a natural sort of um, push for those of us uh, who have PhDs to write about things that are interdisciplinary and then to find partners from other departments who are willing to um, engage with them. Yeah. So I've done quite a bit of that work and that has been a change and I think it's a positive one because if, well, I think business schools still are silos, but yeah. law schools um, I think are more integrated now and not just in a service kind of way because um, law professors make very good committee chairs or, or you know, heads of various faculty things, uh, institutes or something. But I think uh, the idea that we can do serious scholarship work in addition to just managing stuff is yeah. Um, yeah, we have begun happened. hiring more PhDs than, than we had before uh, in, in, the more recent, in the more recent era. PhDs in economics and history, um, philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and I think those, that's been a great, it's been a great uh, change, not just because of the potential for collaboration, but that these are areas that can, um, you know, influence and help in thinking through and about law's role in society. Mm -hmm. So I think that's basically been a, a very good thing. Um, any, what about for women, you know, when, when uh, you know, have things changed for women law professors from when? Well, the big one is maternity were, leave. Oh my God. I never Jesus. had, yeah. I never had any maternity leave. It didn't I, exist. Five kids, sometimes I'd have to like um, front load courses and yeah so that I could take a week off after I delivered. In the field, um, usually, and then you go back to the crops, right? You drop the kid in the field and you yeah, go back to raising Yeah, just about, just about. Um, 
so that's been different. Um, I think the idea that your tenure clock may stop yes. for some period of time while yes. you're taking those leaves has also really yeah. helped. Um, I think at the beginning, women were pushing for them, but now they just sort of see that, that it's something that is a matter of right. You exactly. know, why wouldn't you have it? Yeah. So the attitude's a little bit different yeah. than, than there's no, people don't feel grateful. Yeah. And I look at them and I think, gosh, you know, <laughs> I wish, what could I have done if I had had yeah. X, you know? Yeah. Um, well, but, for me, of course, I didn't have children, you know, and that's one reason. I didn't believe that I could on my own raise a child, get tenure, do, you know, and um, so that happened to a number of people. Um, mm -hmm. you, I'm, you know, you were like Wonder Woman, <laughs> you know, these, this, these yeah, amazing hard kids. on the marriage. Yes, I just, well, I, I wasn't able to successfully stay married either, um, and I think career for me was a big big part of, uh, of that. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought there. I think that women are still disadvantaged to mm -hmm. some degree, um, partly because the students tend to, to be able to relate, especially during their first year, um, more easily to the men. Some of the men still have, you know, wives who are doing all the backup stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and allowing them to be ideal workers in, mm -hmm. in Joan Williams' term. Um, but um, sometimes, I don't know, maybe they're not so shy and nerdy. Um, maybe they just can, are, are more, um, more easy, it's easier for them to be um, at ease and confident and that kind of thing than we were certainly where you know you prepare 10 hours for every hour of class i did that i still every do. I, I mean still do yeah. yeah yeah but certainly with a new course I, yeah. I do it um but it's still a lot more than the students spend and i suspect it's a lot more than our male colleagues who walk in there and wing it do um i think we're not allowed to make mistakes to the same yes extent that yeah. men are um that even admitting that that you weren't right about something is is unacceptable for for women where it wouldn't be for yeah i i definitely men. you know having read tenure files at four different law schools that when a woman we all make mistakes uh to state the obvious when a woman makes a mistake maybe this article wasn't so good was ill-conceived and especially if it's an early article or, um, I don't know, maybe selecting the wrong topic or um, you deciding to write a book when maybe they really needed to focus on smaller smaller pieces of the book, whatever it might be, co-authoring, um, that, that sometimes it comes, or it feels like it's coming from a paternalistic point of view. Oh dear, I want her to get tenure, and already she's, uh, she's slipping a little bit. Maybe, the, maybe a set of evaluations that weren't so good, as happened with me, my first set. They weren't, they weren't the worst in the school, but they weren't good. Um, I think that people over-respond and, con and convey that anxiety to the woman, who then kind of begins to feel like, oh my God, I just started and I'm, I, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna make it. And I do think that we don't see those so much as mistakes when it's the young men making the mistakes. Mm -hmm. We being general, I, I like to think I try to see clearly on everything, but I do believe that that still goes on. Another thing that wasn't caused by gender, but I think has been very helpful for women law faculty coming up is the notion that you do have a pre-tenure leave. And that was never there, uh, when, at least when I was teaching before. And also that you don't start teaching four courses or three courses. You, you are eased into it, so you have more time uh, to prepare. Uh, another difference I see is the over-credentialing uh, of, um, of um, new law teachers. Would, would somebody with your background be hired today by Notre Dame or any prestigious school? No. I mean, I, I had, like you, I had law review, but I didn't come from one of the top three schools. Right. Um, I did not have a federal clerkship. I had a state yeah. court clerkship. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I hadn't already produced three pieces of scholarship before I went, started, t 
teaching. Yeah. yeah. You know, I didn't have one of these VAPs or fellowships. Visiting assistant professorships, yeah. 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 Um, or, you know, Olin fellowships or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the same for so, me. I mean, how many Seton Hall grads are in the law faculties? Uh, maybe it. Yeah. Uh, Hastings, there might be five or six. And they were all kind of accidental, stumbled yeah. into things kind yeah. of uh, stories. So you're right, the average, I, and I worry about that. And increasingly, somebody will also have a PhD. Um, but the average person has been, I guess you had to have known really early on, I'm going to be a law professor and I'm going to go through all the steps that you need to go through. And have someone tell you what those steps are. And know what those steps are. Which I mean, requires some mentoring. Which right. Maybe even being told you should study for the LSAT or take a prep course for the yeah, LSAT. Would, would be a good you thing. Know, or uh, think I, about a clerkship when like I didn't even think about a clerkship. But yeah, not just a federal clerkship maybe, but a court of appeals clerkship. And, yeah. And, um, you know, the right, frankly, the one of five maybe law schools that you attended, and then, and then even if you attended the, those law schools, kind of the right recommenders from those law schools, right. you know, the people that are highly regarded as, as really producing great law professors and the right clerkships, and then, then a visiting assistant professorship and Olin or one of the other kinds of maps that that schools now have that didn't exist when I started uh, teaching. But if you think about them. that, I mean, it requires you to make a decision early. It also requires you to have money. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a path that it, that yeah. isn't going to be encouraging to people who come from backgrounds like yeah. like yours yeah. in particular. Sort of feel like they have some uh, luxury. Yeah. Uh, well, it's like PhD. I mean, a good example would be PhDs. I was actually a Greek major in, in uh, college. I was always very bookish. I loved ancient Greek. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to get a PhD in, in Greek and be a Greek teacher? So I did actually think about teaching. Um, and two things happened. First, my um, professor said, oh, it's too bad you're a woman. You'd be a great Greek, you know, professor of Greek, but you know, there aren't any women. Well, if you marry, like Ann Dale, she married so-and-so, and so she got the position at Stanford, uh, but it's very unlikely. Then nobody told me that if you get into a PhD program, it's paid for. So I saw six or seven years in which I would have to be somehow writing a dissertation right. and learning more ancient languages and... Working. Working, and so I just took it off the table. So just that little thing that Everybody else seemed to know, I found out later, that no, you get into a really good PhD program, you get a stipend, you don't pay tuition. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of that stuff. So, um, yeah, there are, I do especially worry about classes of people who are kept out of law teaching, who could have, a, I think you contribute, you made great contributions. Mm -hmm. And where are the other Peg Brinnigs and, and where are the other Nell Newtons? Um, you know that, and and the answer is they're not, they're not getting hired, and I do, I do worry about that. Mm -hmm. I also worry about the expense, so that the expense um, was very low, mm -hmm. even though it was still hard. I mean, I always had to work. You always had to work, but we I don't know if you didn't. You didn't always have to work. But I, always I did work. in law school when the marriage yeah. crumbled. Oh yeah, right, sure. Um, the expense is just a, a real problem, and as a as a leader, as administrator, I sit there and look at it and figure, well, how could we cut the cost of legal education? And the answer is, uh, with the proliferation of staff, 